Praise God. Now I want you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew 21. Now, those of you who know me well understand that I'm not the kind of preacher that if it's Mother's Day, I'm going to ser- give a sermon on motherhood or women or Father's Day, a sermon on fathers. Or I don't do Thanksgiving sermons on Thanksgiving. I would if I was given one, but I, you know, preachers have a lot less choice than you think. But there is one exception to that, and that is two holidays, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. I always like to preach about Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday because those two holidays are invested with about a third of all Bible prophecy. They are so significant. That is the week that changed the whole world and the world's never been the same since and never will be. That is a week in which all our destinies are invested and that is the most significant thing. Everything that happened in that week, which is chock full, is right there. That's why, that's why if you really study the Gospels closely, you realize that about a third of some of those Gospels is that week. That's all. Everything else is incidental to what happened on Palm Sunday. So I always love it, and I hope uh, that you can get some light and that you will indulge me on this teaching because I believe that it's the will of God. Matthew chapter 21 Okay, verse 1. When they drew near unto Jerusalem, and they were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. So it's all geographical. It's all real. It's in the world of concrete real. Okay. Jerusalem, we know what that is. Most important city on earth. The little village of Bethphage, which means house of figs, which that will come into importance, and uh, the Mount of Olives, we know that that's real. That's a real piece of real estate. That's one thing you got to remember when you read the Bible. It's all real. It's not just philosophical. It's real. Jesus Christ is going to put his feet on the Mount of Olives when he comes back. We are told that in the Bible. We have a geographical location for Christ. I hope they set up a, a camera on, on the Mount of Olives so we can watch that every day and see. Okay. Now, he says to two of his disciples... Uh, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you'll find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. Now this is really awesome too. You come down the road, the disciples just did what Jesus said. They found not an unusual sight, an ass with a colt, probably nursing, attached to it. He says, Take them both and bring them to me. And if anyone asks you about it, here's what you say. (laughs) That's amazing, right? Either that was a preordained thing or that's a miracle that you just go up to some stranger and borrow their car and they say, go ahead, you know. Good have been either. Verse 4, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, tell you the daughter of Zion. Behold, thy king comes unto you, meek and sitting on an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, that'd be quite a sign, quite a sight to see a king riding on a donkey with a little donkey attached to it. It's not exactly inspiring if you believe in worldly power. See, the prophecy, as I have just pointed out a couple weeks ago, the prophecy he quoted is Zechariah chapter 9. The first part of that chapter, I won't turn you there, he gives a prediction of the conquest of Alexander the Great, an undisputed conqueror. To this day, he's known as Alexander the Great. He absolutely Hellenized the whole world, took over the whole known world. He, was, he died of a broken heart, partly because he, he cried, because he couldn't find anywhere else to conquer. I mean, he was one of the greatest people in history in that sense, and people trembled and feared because of him. And, Zechariah predicts his exact route through the Holy Land, tells which city. He'll take this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. And then he says that uh, the next verse is another conqueror, but not exactly in the same form as Alexander the Great. He says, don't be afraid, Zion. Look, your king comes to you, meek and lowly, riding on the colt of an ass. 
bringing salvation with him. What a contrast, right, between Antichrist and Christ and worldly power and true power, which is hidden in weakness. So that's the next thing, okay. And then he says that uh, as the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the ass and the colt and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. So they made a saddle out of their clothes, right? And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. So they clear, the, they make a path like, with clothes on it and garments and branches of trees and everything like that. And that is a great homage to the king, right? The king is riding into the city for his coronation, and so they do homage. And there's only one other place in the Bible where that is done. And that is in Kings, when King Jehu approached. And he took the crown and approached the city because he was on his way to destroy the temple of Baal. The idolatry was so ripe. And the people were so happy in this king who was going to conquer the paganism that had just infested and destroyed their nation that they got their clothes out on the road and they put branches down there as if to say, look, it's the red carpet, basically the ancient version of the red carpet. So King Jehu in Kings is on his way to destroy the temple of Baal. But King Jesus is on his way to destroy once and for all the evil spirit that inspired Baal, Satan himself. As he'd say on this very procession in John, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the proud prince of this world cast down. And if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The death of Satan has already happened. The, the doom of Satan is already done. The sentence has been passed and the, the act has been done and Jesus has conquered. Now look, everything else is just a mop up, just like after D-Day. I mean, that Germany was done, Hitler was done, it was over. There's still a war, but uh, it was already a, a given who won. Everything else is incidental. Well, Jesus conquered Satan, just like Jay who conquered Baal. And it's a very, very funny story how, how Jehu destroyed the temple of Baal. What he did is he made an announcement for all Baal worshipers and sodomites to meet in the temple for a great festival. And they thought, oh, this is a king just like the one before, Ahab and the others, you know. Wow, good, we're going to have the sin keep going. And he got him in there and locked the doors and slaughtered every one of them. How many know you won't see a picture of that in a kid's coloring book, will you? Or on a Hallmark card, okay, but, but he wiped out Baal. He wiped out the Baal worship. And guess what? Jesus wiped out the proud king of this world, the prince of this age, and the satanic kingdom has already been destroyed. Now, let me go on, okay? He says, they, the multitudes that went before and followed him cried, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed he is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now this has everything to do with what happened on Palm Sunday. And you cannot understand what happened on Palm Sunday unless you take this into account. What they're saying there, they're quoting the 118th Psalm. Very, very important. Quoting the 118th Psalm, and themes from that Psalm just completely saturate the whole account of what happened on Palm Sunday and what happened that week following. The, he says, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, in the first place, um, you also got to take into consideration something before I actually take a look at Psalm 118. You got to take into consideration when Jesus and John the Baptist arrived on the scene in history. This is really, really important. Many people cannot understand the Gospels because they don't understand this and they don't take it into account. Jesus and John the Baptist arrived on the scene of history 40 years before an absolutely devastating judgment, the worst judgment Israel had ever seen. A judgment so devastating that to this day they have never gotten over it. The scattering of the holy people from one end of the earth to the other. There's only a trickle that came back so far. 
They, they never got over. The temple raised to the ground. Everything, I mean, they couldn't imagine what was about ready to happen. They had no idea what was about ready to happen. A million Jews at the time, a million people is a lot of people in the first century. A, a million Jews killed and the world's slave markets glutted with Jews. The temple, uh, the Colosseum in Rome, built by Jewish slaves, financed by the temple treasury. The Ark of Titus commemorates for all time the destruction of the temple. And Jesus and John the Baptist come 40 years before this. So that gives you a new understanding of the urgency of their message. What did both of them preach? Repent. Judgment is coming. You've got to get right with God. Judgment is coming. It's the, the, like John said, the ax is already related to the root of the tree. They knew what he's talking about. That Isaiah said that his Syrians were like an ax at the root of the tree. Judgment's coming. Get yourself right with God. Prepare you the way of the Lord. Now, that's another subject for another time. But, um, you know, you got, you got well, b before I get into the psalm itself, this is a holiday. This is the commencement of a holiday. Now, Jewish holidays have a twofold purpose. Number one, they are holidays. God ordained them in Leviticus 23. God set up a holiday uh, system for them. How uh, you know they don't have Valentine's Day or anything like that? <laughs> they have their own holidays that God ordained. And when God did ordain them through Moses, the way he talked about them, he called them appointed days, or you could even translate it appointments with me. Appointments with me. Now, this is the, the, what, what holiday was commencing when Jesus rode into Jerusalem? Does anyone know? Passover. By the way, we're in Passover right now. This is the Jewish Passover. Started last night. It'll end tonight. Passover. Okay. Now, those Passover is one of the seven holidays, and what they have is like they they divide it into three sections. There's three holidays in the spring. There's one holiday in the long hot summer, and there's three holidays in the fall. And they're all kind of the spring and fall. They're all clumped together. Then they're not only national holidays. They're also God-ordained appointments. In other words, God said, I, will, I have an appointment with you. Okay, I'm going to, in, in other words, he's going to meet with them on these. They actually spell out history, it's true history. Okay, in the spring, you got the Feast of Passover, and you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and you've got the Feast of First Fruits. Now look, this is the Passover that God will actually meet with them and do what the feast portrays. The real lamb of God is going to come and offer himself as a blood sacrifice so that the judgment that they deserve will not come on them. The real removal of all leaven, which leaven is a type of sin. Sin is about to be removed. And the real first fruits, three days later, where the high priest of Israel goes out in the field and cuts the first part of the, of the grain and waves it before the Lord. And as he was doing that, Jesus' tomb emptied. He arose from the dead as the first fruits of the real harvest, not grain, humanity. We're going to get harvested, right? So in history, the first part of these feastal appointments, oh, they still keep them, and they will. But the appointment part is done. It's in history now. Jesus came on Passover. Jesus died to remove all our sin. On the third day, God raised him from the dead. See, the appointment's kept. What the, the, what's the middle feast? Does anyone know what the middle feast is? Pentecost, that's right. On the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts chapter 2, in the long, hot summer, 50 days after the other feast, that's what, where we get the word Pentecost, the feast of 50. 50 days after, the Holy Spirit of God came down from heaven like a mighty rushing wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues and the Spirit gave them utterance. So look, that feast is kept. It's already happened. Pentecost has already happened. Removal of sin has already happened. 
Passover lamb has already happened. The blood's already been shed. And the resurrection's already happened. But there's three appointments yet to be fulfilled. Three of them. Number one, the Feast of Trumpets. What's the Bible say? The trumpet shall sound. Okay. Number two, the Day of Atonement. Remember, this is Israel-centered. I mean, to this day, on the Day of Atonement, you will see Jews some, sometimes observing a fast, wearing a prayer shawl, and going around and free, asking people to forgive them their sins that they've done in some kind of a parody of the Day of Atonement. The nation will be brought to repentance. And then the final one is like every single holiday that the Gentiles have and the Jews have and anyone has all rolled up in one called the Feast of Tabernacles. And what's it say in the, in the book of Revelation? Finally, God shall dwell with men. <laughs> this, is, this is the appointment schedule. The first four have been fulfilled, but the last three we're waiting for were very, very much on the, two, on, the, on the very verge. Now, I want to say something about this Feast of Passover, this year's Feast of Passover. I think it's extraordinary. It's very, very unusual. I have yet to find out if it actually happened, but it was practiced about a week ago where the Jewish Temple Mount Institute... It's a very, very respected institution in, in Israel, and even a lot of Christians work with them. They want to rebuild the temple. They want to rebuild the temple so bad. And every year they used to have these big demonstrations where we're going to go up that, that temple mountain, and we're going to offer a sacrifice on the temple mountain, all that. And every year they get turned away because the temple mountain is under custodianship of something called the Waqf. W-A-Q-F. If you can pronounce it better, tell me. All right. Waqf. It's an Arabic uh, Muslim institution which has a custody of the Temple Mount, and they say who can go up there and who can't, right? So they always get turned down. They don't want Jews praying on the Temple Mount. They don't want sacrifices on the Temple Mount. The last thing they'd want is a temple on the Temple Mount, right? And that was strictly Jordan, right? The king of Jordan, Abdullah, and his, and his father, Hussein, they established the walk, then they were very strict guardians of that Temple Mount. I mean, and thus they, they fulfilled the scripture, too. In 1967, the Temple Mount was taken over. And they turned it right over to the walk again. The Jews had the Temple Mount. First time in 2,000 years, turned it over to the walk. I could never understand why they would do that. Even when I was not a Christian, we saw the, the Six-Day War, and we just saw those paratroopers weeping at the wall. We thought, wow, the Jews could do it in Jerusalem now. No, they couldn't. They turned it right over to the Waqf. Never understood why they did that until I read a passage in Luke 21 that says, Jerusalem shall be trodden under foot of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled. <laughs> The Bible is like a Swiss watch. The prophecy are like the little springs and gears. Totally precise. And nothing, nothing can stop it. Now, about a week ago, I, or I don't know, about a month ago, I saw an article about the people going up with serious surveying equipment on the Temple Mount. And they're, looking, they're walking around in shoes that have special coverings so that they're polyurethane souls won't touch that sacred ground <laughs> and they're making measurements and they they could have just you know the guy that wrote the article said they could just use google maps and make a sky measurement then they wouldn't have any problem no they wanted to get up there why they wanted precision what they what are they measuring but by the way the same time i read that i just read in revelation 11 take a read and measure the temple mount Keep the outside for the, the Gentiles. They could still trample it. But go up there with the reed and measure it. Well, they're measuring for the exact state of the, the exact location of the offer, altar of burnt offering. Why are they doing that? Because they want to offer a lamb on the Temple Mount at Passover. Now, why isn't the walk throwing a fit? 
And this is just, I hope you don't mind my little sidetracks. The walk usually throws a fit over if you so much as utter a prayer on that Temple Mount. They will get you arrested, they will throw you off, they will stone you, okay? So why is this being allowed? Well, recent events in the Arab world are very turbulent. Now, that's nothing new, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but they're really turbulent now because the Saudis, who financed world terrorism, hated Israel, called them the great Satan, called us Satan, everything, are terrified of two of their Muslim brothers, Iran and Turkey. How terrified? They're so terrified that they're actually working with Israel. And they're so terrified that King Solomon, uh, Mohammed bin Solomon, the new king of Saudi Arabia, actually had Arabs ingested into the waqf. And the policies are loosening up. And there is a public debate over there in Saudi Arabia. You know, the Temple Mount, we say it's a third holiest site, but it really belongs to the Jews. <laughs> this is unprecedented, but that's how scared they are of Turkey which is Sunni, and Iran, which is Shiite. That they're actually going to work with Israel, and they're actually going to loosen the waqf up. And they're going to allow something to happen. Now, I have not checked yet, but supposedly it's happened yesterday. For the first time since 70 AD, a lamb offered on that location the Temple Mount. Now I want to tell you something. That lamb is, a, is an abomination and that offering is an abomination. It's all an abomination. Don't, don't, don't think I think that this is like a really positive thing. It is positive only in this sense. Scripture is being fulfilled and we're much closer to the return of the Messiah. He's coming. Now, they, they practiced it right out the city walls. They built a stone altar and they went up. The priests had their priestly uniforms, the silver trumpets, the offer. They practiced it, but I don't know if they did it. I hope, I hope they did, really, because I want, to get, I want Jesus to come back. Anyway, let me get back to this. This is Passover, see? And uh, this is the Passover. Now, the song, uh, hold your finger in Matthew 21 and go with me to Psalm 118. Now, Look, you know how we, Gentiles even, have our holidays, and there are certain songs associated with holidays. Now, the most glaring example is Christmas carols, right? So we, we know them, and we sing them. We sing them all our life. In fact, we, we sing them so much that half the people singing them don't even know what they're singing, right? It's just tradition. It's beautiful. It's heartwarming. It's nostalgic. But really, the truth is... The, most of the songs are really old, and people don't understand the terminology. So you just sing it anyway. Hark the herald angels sing. I mean, you could finish it, right? Uh, joy to the world. <laughs> and um, some of them are like a thousand years old. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. That's ancient. Oh, come, all ye faithful. That's ancient. And you sing them. You sing them every year. And I, I don't know about you, but I've always been a Christmas person. I just love them. I just love Christmas carols. And almost every musician, whether they're Christian or not, they'll come out with a Christmas album because that's how popular they are. But the truth is you don't really know, right? Now, that's the way Psalm 118 is to the Jews. It's part of the what's called the Halal Rabbah, the great song, Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. Okay. The great song that they play, especially at Passover. So it's a Passover carol. All right. Now, look at this. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say his mercy endureth forever. So far, so good. Very, very easy to understand. And notice it's in antiphon. You guys know what antiphon is? The priest sings the first part and the people sing the second. So, 
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And they say, his mercy endureth forever. That's right. It's antiphon. Okay. Now, let them now that fear the Lord say, his mercy endureth forever. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I won't fear. What can man do to me? The Lord takes my part with them that help me. Therefore, I'll see my desire on those that hate me. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations surround me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about, yea, they compassed me about, but in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They're quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord... I will destroy them. You have thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord has become my strength and song and has become my salvation. By the way, the word, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my strength and my song become my salvation. Is become, and guess what the word is in the Hebrew that was originally written in? Yeshua. What's Jesus' name in Hebrew? Yeshua. Now, so far, do you notice though, so far almost everything in here is not that much different than what you read in the 150 other psalms, okay? It's just very, very psalmic. It's very, very good. It's triumphant, victory, and trust in the Lord. But it gets a little different from here on. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. I love that verse. The Lord hath chastened me sore. He hasn't given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation and are Yeshua. Now here's where it gets different. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Now it doesn't sound too different to us because we read the Gospels and that's in the Gospels a lot. But what's it, what? What's this mean? The stone that the builders rejected has become the head of the cornerstone. Okay, and then he says, uh, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. How many have ever heard that before? <laughs> nice. I love that one too. And we used to have the song. This is the day. This is. The... Okay. So save now I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. We just sang that one. It's in different words. Hosanna. Hosanna. Save us now. Save us. Blessed be he that comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has showed us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. What? See, you sing it every year, so it's just part of the thing, you know. And, and Jesus and the disciples, they kept these feasts. They sang it every year of their life, all right? In fact, when the book of Mark says Jesus and the disciples went out after the Last Supper, they sang a hymn and then went out. This is what they'd be singing right here. The great, great song, the Halal Rabbah. He says... Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise thee. You are my God, I will exalt thee. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Okay, now here, here's the thing I'm getting at, and, I, and I'll come right to the point, is that um, you sing it, and you, you could sing it and not know it. Okay, I can never forget um, when I turned 18 or 19, I became a Christian, and I never thought about it before, but we then, we, we started singing the Christmas carols. And I was in a church, and there were carols I just knew all my life. But all of a sudden, the words exploded. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph in the sky. With angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Born to save the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth all of a sudden boom we've been singing about being born again 
We've been singing about salvation. I didn't know it. I liked it, but never knew what I was singing. Though that's old archaic language and everything. It's part of the charm. I didn't know what I was singing about. But how many have that experience where all of a sudden you get saved and you realize, wow, this is, I've experienced this. This is real. Okay, because it's possible to have a carol. So anyway, they're all singing uh, Psalm 118. We'll go back to Matthew. Every one of them, they're singing Psalm 118. They're praising God, and they're in holiday mode, and they are just doing this, okay? And what it is, though, it says, like, part of the psalm is, open to me the gates of righteousness, that the righteous nation may enter in. See, what that is in psalms, when you see stuff like that, that means that it's a procession. It's a procession. And basically, one, one theologian said, well, you know, this psalm, a king has won a battle, and he's headed to the temple to celebrate and praise God. And it's antiphon again. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that the righteous nation may enter in. And then from in, they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they said, we welcome you out of the house of the Lord. Now that's the other part of it, right? There's two parts. The one, open the gates, and the other, come on in. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We welcome you out of the house of the Lord. Now here's the ironic thing about this, because I, I, you know, I could go on, on, bind the sacrifice with cords of the altar. The stone that the builders rejected. You know, you sing these songs, there's, oh, of course there's these weird, weird verses that if anyone asks, what's that mean? Most people don't know. But really what, what is going on on Palm Sunday is finally the time for the fulfillment of that psalm had occurred. Now they didn't know they're playing out a drama because the drama goes like this. The Messiah wins a great battle and comes in triumph and process uh, with his procession into the city and unto the temple. The priests are supposed to go out as leaders of the nations, throw open the door, and recognize, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a very specific technical saying. It says, you are the one that fulfilled the prophecies. You are the one qualified. You are the Messiah according to what the prophecies say. And we recognize that. And then they're supposed, we welcome you into the house of the Lord. And... Also, the line which we're all familiar with, but very few really understand what it means. This is the day the Lord hath made. Now, I say it all the time. I probably said it to someone this morning. How are you doing, Pastor? This is the day the Lord has made. I love it. Always have loved that. But really, that's talking about a specific calendar day long predicted by prophets. Okay. And uh, one example that you're probably familiar with, but Daniel 9 is a precision numeric prophecy that from 500 years before Christ, he predicted to the day, Palm Sunday. He said the Messiah is going to come after 583 years from the point of a certain decree that happened in history, and he will present himself to the nation. The Savior will come for the nation to what? To accept or reject him. Now, Daniel tells us what happened. Well, then he'll be cut off, but not for himself. Jesus didn't die for himself, did he? He died for us. That's why we have that, that table. That's why we observe that supper. Jesus died for us. Messiah shall come. And so when they're going, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord, they don't realize this is the day. And when they get to the point of, open the gates of righteousness, just then that's when Jesus is coming to the temple. And then when the priest is supposed to say, uh, we welcome you in the house of the Lord. And we recognize you are the one that God promised. Wow, history would be different if they had done that. But instead, it's the other weird verse that's fulfilled. 
the stone which the builders rejected, it became the head of the corner. Read the account. Jesus actually throws that at them. The stone which the builders rejected has become the most important stone. And this is the Lord's doing. And it's wonderful in our eyes. Then what? Well, within a few days, bind the sacrifice with cords. Jesus is led over the Kidron Valley and up outside of the city. And bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. The altar of God had four corners. The cross of Jesus has four corners. And the psalm was fulfilled. Jesus was bound and nailed to the four corners and offered to God. And what, what's happening, and look, this is happening now. This is happening today. And this is even happening close. That people are walking out and fulfilling prophecies without even knowing it. I mean, it's just like they go through their motions and they have no idea that they're fulfilling prophecy. Israel wanting to reinstate temple sacrifice, that's prophecy. Daniel warned that Antichrist would help them. We're very close to this. Antichrist would help them reestablish sacrifice. Antichrist will help them and even have a covenant for seven years. But then in the middle of the covenant, he will end all sacrifice. He will cut it off. That's one of the signs that he's Antichrist. So they are elated. There are people in Israel elated. I saw a film of the priests in their uniforms and their trumpets. And they're putting the sacrifice on the altar. And I mean, everyone's just so happy and elated because there's this false belief that if the Jews could ever get their temple back, then peace would come to the world. And the Jews aren't the only ones that believe that, by the way. Jared Kushner believes that. Now, he is a Jew. But the Arabs believe that. And there's a very wealthy Turkish man who's a Muslim. He's a billionaire. He believes it. He's pouring money in for, to help them get that temple ready. The temple in Jerusalem is going to be rebuilt. It'll be abomination to God. But the world will rejoice for so many different reasons. So... Here we go. Now, there's a couple other things I want to talk about. When Jesus comes toward the city, everyone is cheering. And they're waving these palm branches, which are really um, three different kind of plants. It's called a laba, And it's really for a different holiday. They got their holidays mixed up. I, I don't think they got them mixed up, but they're so elated that they're acting like it's the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the end when everything is great, Jerusalem is restored, all is well, and that's the great anticipation. If you read like Revelation 7, that is just one big feast of tabernacles right there. So they all have the palm, right? But they skip the one with the suffering. Well, isn't that all so human? That we want the crown and not the cross. So they just skip from Passover to the feast. And they make these labas with the word, which is uh, palms and I think it's pomegranates and uh, it's the instructions for tabernacle. And they wave these because they think, wow, the kingdom is here. This is the son of David. Notice they said the son of David. And they got, see, the thing is the messiahs, the rabbis would teach from, from prophecy. They couldn't figure out how you could have a, a suffering Christ and a victorious Christ. So they came up with two Christs. One they called Messiah, the son of Joseph, because when you read the story of Joseph, he suffered. And how do you know they're half right? Messiah, well, he wasn't really the son of Joseph, but his father, his stepfather was Joseph. But they said, look, there's going to be a suffering Messiah based on Isaiah 53 and other passages, Psalm 22. And then there's going to be the son of David. And what did they anticipate of the son of David? Victory. Throw those Romans out. Just destroy them. Wipe them out. And take, bring us back to our rightful place as the joy of the whole earth and the chosen people and the holy people and everything like that. I don't, I don't blame them. It would be miserable to be an occupied country in the first century. They wanted, but they, what they wanted is the crown but not the cross. 
So they're, they're literally thinking, when they're saying son of David, David is a conqueror, a military hero. David is going to throw off the Romans. David is going to throw off the Gentiles. And we are going to be taken back to our rightful place, the center of the world, the joy of the whole earth. And Jesus, they're cheering and they, are, they, they can't wait. Even the disciples are fighting over who's going to sit on the right or the left, right? But Jesus gets there and over one hill he looks down on the city and he weeps. He weeps. And it doesn't say it's like soft weeping like at Lazarus' tomb. This is like Hebrews says, loud crying and tears. His heart breaks. He looks at the city of Jerusalem. Why does he weep? What could he see that they, they couldn't see? Well, number one, he knew what was going to happen in 40 years. You know those little kids that were going around saying, Hosanna, Hosanna? And the Pharisees said, make them shut up. That's blasphemy. Don't let those kids praise you. And Jesus said, didn't you read? Out of the mouth of babes, God ordained strength. He knew what those kids' life would be like 40 years from that date when they're adults. And when they'd see their own kids' brains dashed against a stone and Roman legions haul them off in chains and scatter them from one end of the earth to the other. Jesus knew all that. And he wept. And he knew that for almost a thousand years, there's nothing but abuse after abuse of privilege. And he knew that the city of Jerusalem, which is gonna be destroyed, was a place where prophets and once functioned. And that temple that was gonna be laid to the ground was a place of the ministry of mercy and that the intercessory prayer and the priesthood would minister. The, and he knew what was gonna happen there, that Yahweh had dwelt there. It's almost like the Psalm in uh, Isaiah five where he says, what more could I do? So he wept while they cheered and then he went in. But the next day, now there's a couple more things I'm gonna say. The next day, Matthew 21, Verse 18. He goes in the city and then he comes out. And then the next day he goes back in. He's sitting in a place in a little village called Bethphage because he had friends that lived there. The house of figs. In the morning as he returned to the city, he hungered. So he's on his way back to the city and he's hungry. So when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only. Now let me, let me explain something about this. The fig has the fruit first, then the leaf, unlike other fruits. Therefore, if you see a fig tree full of leaves, then what should you expect to see? Fruit. So he see, he's hungry, and he sees a fig tree full of leaves. So he goes to it and looks, picks up one leaf after another, and there's no fruit. And so he cursed the fig tree. He literally said, let no fruit grow on you from here on and forever. He cursed the fig tree. Now, he did not curse the fig tree because he's irritated that he's hungry. He did not curse the fig tree uh, to show his power. Or he did not curse the fig tree to teach people how to have faith. Okay. His cursing of the fig tree is a prophetic action. It's not like if you learn how to do what Jesus did. I used to listen to teachers like Copeland and Hagen. They say, see, he did it. And you could do it too if you had the faith. That's not the meaning of this story. The meaning of this story is this. He, that fig tree is a sign. What do fig trees represent? Well, they represent the blessing of God upon Israel. If you remember, there's a very important scripture that's repeated several times in the prophets. Every man under his vine every man under his fig tree. That's the picture, the very picture of the good life. So what's he saying? No one, no one is gonna eat fruit of you from here on. He's talking to that generation. He's talking even more to the, than to the people. He's literally talking of the temple. See, look what happens here. It says, uh, 
When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? Verse 20. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say to you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea, it shall be done. Well, what's he saying there? Well, a lot of people think that that's teaching faith. Okay. No. And other people think, well, you know, the mountains of your life, speak to them and they'll move. <laughs> That's ridiculous. It's not just any mountain. It's the most important mountain on earth. The Temple Mountain, where God has put his name forever. And where, if I have understood correctly, Jews offered a lamb in rebellion on the Temple Mount. Everything that happens on the Temple Mount is huge, right? He's saying, you see that mountain? And on the, what's on that mountain? The temple. And one of the most magnificent specimens of a building in the whole world. Herod is the one, by the way, that, that built it up. King Herod. He's a horrible man, but he's one of the great builders of the ancient world. He said, that is going to be plucked up and cast into the sea. Now, let me interpret that prophetically. The sea are the nations. The wicked are like the sea. Why do the heathen rage? The nations are in an uproar. He's making a prediction. This nation is going to lose its blessing, and that temple is going to be plucked up and cast into the sea. Now, you can go to Rome to this day and see the Roman legionaries plundering the temple. And one of the things you could see from the ground looking up at the Arch of Titus is the holy candelabra from the holy place in the temple being carted off by Gentiles. The words of Jesus are true. See, it's the next thing that happens. Now, I'm just going to take you through two more things, and I'll be brief. This is Passover week. So multitudes of people are bringing lambs to the temple so the priests can destroy them. Um, not destroy them. Inspect them. <laughs> I'm, I'm confusing that because what he did after he predicted the destruction of the temple was he went to the temple and he overturned the money changers. And a lot of people think, well, that's just because Jesus doesn't like greed. So money changers shouldn't be in there. Well, money changers had to be in there because most money was idolatrous. So they'd have money changers set up in there to give temple shekels. They had to deal with that money, so that's not really what it was all about. That was a prophetic action, too. The temple's going to be destroyed. Remember what the disciples said? Lord, look at the stones of this temple. You can read about it in Matthew 24. Man, amazing. And they were amazing. They were huge. And Jesus said to them, you see these stones? Not one of them will be left on another. All will be destroyed. And the Bible says the disciples couldn't believe it. It was unfathomable. But guess what? Forty years later, there's a siege around Jerusalem. Christians are basically kind of raptured because they got away. And the Roman general, Titus, said, do not disturb that temple. It's one of the most beautiful, one of the, one of the wonders of the world. Don't touch it. Don't hurt it. But the fighting was so intense that it actually broke out in the temple. And the curtains were set on fire. And the crown molding was of gold, and it was melted, and the fire went in between the stones. And the people did something almost unprecedented for the day. They disobeyed a Roman general's orders. They went into a frenzy, and they pried each stone off the other to get the gold. And thus, the order of Titus proved to be false, but the prediction of Jesus proved to be true to the detail. This is crazy, right? This is heavy stuff. But what's going to happen at the end of this week? The Messiah is going to lay his life down as a sacrifice for our sins. The most significant thing that ever happened in human history. But before he does that, pilgrims have come to Jerusalem and they're flowing into the temple with lambs. And they're bringing them to priests to be approved. A lamb without blemish. And Jesus is in the temple teaching. And other priests 
are quizzing him, asking hard questions, trying to trap him. Now, there's a connection. You're looking for flaws in the lamb. You're looking for flaws in Jesus. If the lamb has no flaws, that doesn't save his life. That dooms him. Jesus, they couldn't find a flaw. And he offered his life. And then the last thing I want to say is that you got, and I won't take you through it, but go to Matthew 23. I'm just going to look at the last two verses. You got the most intense and blistering sermon of any of the prophets in the Bible ever gave in Matthew 23. It's, it makes Jeremiah and Isaiah look like pikers, okay? I mean, Jesus Christ in the name of God as the word of God really, really gives the sermon and a half. And at the end, though, he says two things. Number one, and this is all along the same line. He says, uh, uh, verse 38 Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Okay, now look, their religion is all centered around the temple. What's he saying? God won't live in that temple anymore. What do you do with a religion that doesn't even have God with it? Now we're finding this out in the modern world. How many of these churches really have God? You think you still have God if you condone gay marriage? You think you still have God in the church if you condone abortion? If you push left-wing politics and socialism and atheism and hatred? You think God's still there? Don't fool yourself. And what's Jesus saying to them? This house is desolate. God doesn't live here anymore. And then the last thing he said to them publicly, this is the last official utterance of Israel's Messiah to Israel. And it's a little more hopeful. I say to you, you will not see me from here on. And I'm glad he didn't stop there. What gives us hope is that word, till. You won't see me from here on. Until. Until what? Until you say... Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. In other words, you will never see me again until you come to the point where you admit that I really am the Messiah. I am the one who came in the name of God. I am the fulfillment of Psalm 118. I met all the criterion for the Messiah and you still rejected me. This is an echo of prophet Hosea where God says to Israel I'm going back to the place I came from and you will not see me until you admit your sin the national sin now look we they the, I think Israel's a microcosm of the human race I mean what happened to them is true of every individual you know you, we got privilege after privilege after privilege we're, we're born and raised in America on every corner there's a church We've been hearing these Bible stories all our life. We're just, we, we, we got a Bible saturated society. So, what's going to happen to someone that still won't believe? What's going to happen to the person who just pushes and pushes and rejects and rejects and throws it out, throws it out, throws it out? Kids that have Christian parents or raised in Christian homes, people that had Christian influences, what's, gonna, what's, what's there for them? Only certain judgment. 40 years, 40 years from that date, everything Jesus predicted came to pass, except one. They will come to the point. Now, what's it going to take? Nothing less than the great tribulation. That's why when we pray for our kids a lot, I always think about kids when I see this. Kids are our disciples. Well, we say, well, Lord, whatever it takes. And we mean it. Whatever it takes. You know, if, if someone loses a hand, Jesus said they'd be better off if they went through life maimed than if they went to hell with both hands. If someone has a, something that cramps their style and it turns them to God, that's worth it. I mean, there is nothing. You guys know this, so I'm just preaching to the choir now. There is nothing as important 
is getting right with God. Nothing. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the joy of this day. I thank you for uh, that for us, our king has come, meek and lowly on the colt of an ass. And yet in that apparent weakness is more power than the world could ever fathom. Lord, as we gather here in the middle for prayer, just lead us and guide us in Jesus' name.